know, embracing, putting more attention on the other side of the coast. You know, the, the Earth's over 70% ocean. You know, we live on the, the minority part of the world, you know, and, uh, and I think you get, you know, uh, and I think, you know, anybody living on the coast can probably relate. Like, you catch yourself being more interested in what's on the other side of the beach, you know? And, uh, and, and that's, I think, for all of us, surfing is kind of just the first part. Ride of Passage podcast, a show focused on turning the camera around and interviewing the photographers, the shapers, and the surf shop owners, in other words, the heartbeat of the surf industry. Today, we're joined by Joe Jessel, father, surfer, friend, DIYer, craftsman, traveler, waterman, human. Today's show would not be possible without our supporters, Wooden Surfboards and Dottie Surf Company. As far as I can tell, Joe has always said yes to the trip when given the opportunity to go. He's the type of guy that likes to do business in the sand, a father that sees his family as his best friend. He's also the first person to ever give me the time of day when I was walking into surf shops when I was first learning how to do it. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the great introduction. I appreciate it. I feel like stories like Joe's need to be told, so we're here to share it. It's a true rite of passage. Joe, you have roots in Costa Rica for the beginning of your surf career and, and getting into the sport. Uh, you've been in a lot of ways a pioneer in Oregon surf. I can't believe I just said Oregon. <laughs> We're going to edit that out. <laughs> oh, that's staying. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You've been Big a founder in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> you've been a pioneer in Oregon surf. Uh, Baja family van life and a lot of time spent down there. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit about that and uh, touch a little bit on your current project with Rancho Norte. Yeah. Um, so excited to get into it. I think, you know, the right place to start is obviously in your humble beginnings. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience in Costa Rica, getting into the sport and, and what that experience was like. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, uh, uh, first, I'm I'm really grateful to be here. I got the opportunity. Uh, I, I really appreciated the opportunity that, that you uh, offered to to invite me down. You know, again, anytime I have the the chance to jump in the jump in the van and put a thousand or two miles on, I'll, I'll always say yes. Humble beginnings in surfing. So I I I'll really I'll have to back the story up a little bit. Um, so I was a kid that grew up in Alaska. I grew up snowboarding from the early, early days of that sport. And I was introduced to surfing actually as a teenager. Uh, my, my mom's family grew up in the LA area, Orange County, uh, LA, Orange County area. I know the folks there, those are two different things. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, and, and yeah, so my uncle was, uh, my mom wasn't a big surfer. She was kind of more of the beach bum type, but my uncle was really into it. Um, and he introduced me to San Onofre back in the, uh, this would have been back in the mid eighties, mm -hmm. um, came down and that just planted a seed. I didn't really take it anywhere. I went right back to Alaska at that time, at that time that we didn't even have wetsuit technology to the point where none of us had surfing on the radar there. We didn't know it, it was even possible, which now it's, now it's commonplace. Everybody surfs in Alaska. So years later, I, I, I spent some time <clears throat> after high school, got into fight and fire. And I got in a position where I had, uh, I could take the winter off and I uh, decided I was going to commit a winter to learning how to surf. So I was um, at my grandma's house and uh, she lived uh, just outside of Temecula at the time. I was house sitting for her. I went to the local video store rented every VHS tape they had that was a surf movie. And uh, in that, just by chance, The Endless Summer 2 uh, was in that stack. <clears throat> and after seeing the clip of Tamarindo, uh, I went through my uh, process of elimination to figure out how to get in touch with Robert August. Um, and I actually was able to, to uh, 
I, I I got him on the phone by calling his surf shop, and he happened to be up in California at his at his U.S. shop, and uh, and and he said, "Yeah, by all means, come on down." You know, I said, "Hey, I, I know nothing. I, I've only tried it a couple times. I really want to go give this a, a shot." And uh, um, so he connected me with some folks to rent a place and rented rented a place sight unseen. Got on the plane, flew down. Did the did the bus trip from uh, from San Jose, the capital. There, walked in the first surf shop I, I saw, picked out a six ten mini gun with two ounce glass and the whole <laughs> the whole nine yards. Figuring that'd be a good place to start and and uh, and Robert and Mark and all those guys they uh, uh, endlessly give gave me a hard time until I I figured out how to buy the right board. You know, yeah, and that that really. Uh, having that kind of foot that that kind of start really helped because i really even just uh in, in starting this whole thing just just learning what board to buy right is is a you're not something you can do without experience and and uh and i six months turned into almost a full year down there um i blew off the next fire season took that one off and and really i i'm surprised i made it back from costa rica because it was, um, I just, w I was 21, 21, 21, 22 years old at the time. Didn't quite hit that entrepreneurial bug and, and just couldn't figure out a way to, to sustain it long term, you know, and, uh, but it was great. It was a, it was a really fun way to get a start surfing, you know, I just kind of got, I stumbled into this, the whole endless summer crew. And uh, I remember when, um, you know, Wingnut came down to to to, to visit Pat O'Connell. I got you know I got to surf with Wingnut and Pat O'Connell right after the endless summer thing. Uh, Mark 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 Martinson, um, which I, rest in peace. I mean, it was just a gem of a guy and uh, really one of the funnest guys I ever surfed with. You know, I mean, just always beaming ear to ear, always screwing with somebody. Like there was never not an active prank going. And just such a cool guy, you know. So, um, yeah, it was uh, I, I was really fun in it. It, it planted the seed for surfing, but it, it there was many years of my life still to come that that surfing was was still, you know, it's hard, right? It's it's hard to uh, it's hard to set yourself up to be able to commit the time that it takes to to really get into this. So, you know, and a lot of years of fighting fires and. And uh, catching some surf when I could, but but uh, which I'm sure we'll we'll get to it. But it wasn't until years later when I moved to Oregon that uh, that I really um, really committed myself 100. percent And we've talked a little bit about your time down in Costa Rica, but weren't I mean early on in our friendship, you were telling me a little bit about um, trying to convince everyone willing to listen to you to buy one of the hotels down on the water because they were literally laying the bricks in the road in the main road into Tamarindo when you were there. So you were, you know, obviously an incredible uh, cast of surfers that you got to get interact with in the early days there for you. I mean, that's, that's top notch, but, um, you know, also being there and seeing it, right? And I think from, from your entrepreneurial story and how I know you, uh, you've always been a bit of an opportunist and you've always seen things before a lot of people do, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about some other things uh, down the line here. But, you know, can you talk a little bit about that experience of like, you know, was was there something about it that you were like, I just know this place is obviously being around the, that type of surfer. Like there's a reason they're there. Right. So so the telltales were there. But yeah. Um, you know, trying to get any, well, what were those conversations like? Because, yeah. you know, we've, we've gone through that a bit with Nicaragua and I sure. remember trying to get people to invest in some dreams we had and they were right. like, no way. Right. So not right. a lot's changed right. in 20, 30 years. Uh, but. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's really funny. You know, people have to see the proof first and that, that the, the proof, once it happens, it's happened, it's past tense. You missed it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever really even framed it that way, but I think that is a was probably a pretty pivotal moment for me in entrepreneurship, you know, because I there wasn't any of us that lived in Tamarindo that didn't know what was happening. I mean, right. it was it was the uh, 2001 
Uh, it was just after 9-11. So um, it was Tamarindo was still a relatively small town. They hadn't started on all the big condo projects. None of that was going in. It was still a, a brick road uh, mm -hmm. down Main Street. And everything else was dirt. Um, and, and those areas like Nosara and all those other ones were completely untapped, obviously. Those were just dirt roads. Yeah. You know, and, and, and not even continuous dirt roads. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like different stretches. You'd have to use the beach or, you know. So, yeah, it was um, it was early on. And, and, and uh, yeah, a buddy of mine turned me on to one of the main hotels down at the, the small. I mean, at that time, there was only a couple that weren't real boutique little hotels. I mean, Joe Walsh had just pulled into town in his bus, which is Rock Surf Camp. Uh, it, it was, I want to say his first year. You know, I, I think maybe he was six months ahead of me. It wasn't very long, because I remember going back and, and uh, I think it was a podcast I was listening to on him that, or that he was being interviewed. He was talking about right around 2001. Mm. Really and he has a, you know, this huge, awesome place and, uh, spent the next 20, whatever, 25 years with uh, Robert August came in and joined forces. So they, you know, Robert was across the street. Uh, Joe's was um, on the beach side. And then I started working at a, at a little place called Boca del Rio. And it was like just a couple, sh couple doors down from Robert's little shop that he had. He had a little shop under the monkey bar. Well, then you continued down Main Street to the to the end where there's the big cul-de-sac and and uh, a lot of action down over there. But there's a little restaurant where we all go to breakfast, Nogi's, and it was the breakfast spot. And this place was like a half acre on the beach with ten to twelve rooms upstairs with a proper restaurant downstairs, fully operational. Uh, and a friend of mine that was a realtor down there said, listen, they got this place listed at 250. If you could come in here with 180, it's yours. Mm -hmm. And I remember at 21 years old, just going, I'm like, this is going to be 10 times that when they get half the condos in that are going to come in. You know? But even, I mean, 180 in cash back then is just an outrageous sum of money. And I mean, uh, you know, it's like I'm 21, 22 years old. Like, I don't really have it together. You know, it's <laughs> like I wouldn't I wouldn't stroke me a check for 180 <laughs> grand at the time. And I kind of knew that and it was one of those things. I didn't I didn't get hung up on it, but I but I saw that. And, and it really that planted a seed that did carry carry on in my professional uh, professional and, and personal life. You know, I, I, I really, you know, after I retired from fire is kind of when my entrepreneurial journey started. And uh, when I when I got married and I don't want to jump around too much, but well, before before we jump into that, because that's where we're headed right away. Sure. But what, I, what I do want to touch on is you also in that short amount of time you were down in Costa Rica got pretty far along with your surfing, um, you know, to have the opportunity to do some tube time, spend time with, you know, icons of the, of the sport. Um, you know, I, I guess where the question comes from and something I always like to touch on in these interviews is like, was that where your moment happened of, you know, surfing is going to be a part of my life from, from now on, or did that happen previous? I was enthralled in it, uh, fascinated by it. And, and I was surfing a minimum of eight hours a day and, and, very commonly would be, you know, I mean, I was in the water because the water and the air is the same down there. You know, you know, like it's, you don't have to get out. Like, yeah. And, uh, and, and I did, it was cool that I was able to really just take full advantage of that. I mean, I, I spent the season, the fire season, not spending too much money at the bar and uh, ended up with everything at, at the, that I had at the end of the season. I walked, had walked in a bank and said, I'll take traveler's checks, please. And they gave me a stack and I took off, you know, and I went and I just had a little shelf with my stack of traveler's checks and I'd peel those things off as I needed. And, and I did nothing but surf for, it was, I think it was 10 months is, is how long that trip ended up. And, and by the time I got to the end, I mean, I was completely out of money and had been for a long sure. time living on somebody's couch and I had to sell my surfboards to get a ticket to Miami just to, just get, to get home. home. Yeah. Yeah. So from there then, um, 
you know, obviously you went on your, your professional journey and going through various different careers. I don't remember, it was fire post Costa Rica, I would assume so, given the timeline. Careers are something I have a, I, <laughs> you, you want to talk about one, just bring it up. I probably, <laughs> t- I probably tried it, you know, and I, well, just you, you started getting into various different careers. Ultimately, it led you back to the coast and you made that personal decision of, of kind yeah. of reinventing yeah. your life in, in a coastal environment. I, I, unless there's something you want to touch on in between there that, I, that specifically. I, you know what? I, long story short, it, so I really enjoyed fighting fire. I, and I, I worked for a um, federal hotshot crew. And, you know, I for seven months out of the year, um, I was either on a, you know, I mean, it was trains, planes, and automobiles. I mean, we used everything. It was whether you were, you know, I'd, one day I'd be flying into Yellowstone and helicopter getting to the line, and then we'd be up in Toke, Alaska, taking boats up to the fire line. And, you know, and um, I mean, it was an amazing career. I, and I just, uh, a lot of the... A lot of what I used the most in my business life really came out of the lessons I got from that. Um, and that was a life goal of yours too, right? I mean, you've always said you you wanted to be a lead Saul on a hot shot so crew. Yeah, yeah. And, and in addition to that, you also met your wife. Yeah, yeah. So I that was my early on I determined, because I really got into fire because I was in high school. I wanted to go be a law. Like, I just, I don't know why. It just, it just spoke to me. I wanted to try that. And, and I learned, you know, pretty quick that that's a real, like, you know, that's one of those industries that just have a lot of family roots and, you know, a lot of, like, you don't, it's really hard to get in from the outside and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and enter into that. But what I found was in, in fire, uh, you do a lot of cutting and you're not production cutting, you know, and so it's almost like sport cutting. You know, because you're you're going through and you're you have to learn how to cut burning trees down. Mm-hmm. You got to really get good at your direction or you can spread the fire and everybody's pissed off. And um, so, yeah, I mean, my first season in fire, I I said, you know, once I kind of learned all the roles and everything, I said, you know, my I, I'm I'm here to be a lead saw in a hot shot crew. And then I was on that crew for it took me took me like six seasons before I was able to, to get into the shots. And then uh, the shots, I was only in for three seasons because I took one off. I took one off in the middle for Costa Rica. Uh, but I, I, I went on to, I was on an Arizona crew for a season. And then from there, um, I got on an Oregon crew that was known for falling. And, uh, and, and then I did end up making lead saw and, and did that my last season, which was the same season that I was engaged to my wife, my, my soon to be wife that was on the crew with me. And, you know, as soon as we, we went into the season, we had, we had met the season before, uh, started dating. We got engaged over that winter, came back, had to tell the crew boss, listen, we're engaged. We'll keep it cool. And this is going to be our last season. And, uh, and I, I really, it was cool because I was able to close the door on that chapter with, I achieved what I was there for. It took me a decade to do it. Um, and you know, after meeting my wife, it was like, okay, it's just time for a new chapter. Like it, 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 this is great. And, and honestly, I could have been perfectly content doing that for the rest of my life, but I just didn't want to try to start a family with, Hey honey, it's April and I'll see you in November. Cause that's, that's what those guys do. And I mean, that they, on top of the inherent risk associated with yeah, the job, I, right? I mean, you, you're, you, literally you know, yesterday, some, you're telling me a story about having to get carted down the mountain because your, your throat has closed up from all the smoke. Like there's, yeah, you know, I mean, people get hurt, people lose their lives, you know, I mean, we're, you know, I luck, I was lucky enough to, we never lost anybody on a crew I was on. We never had any real major injuries. Um, but I certainly was on fires that people didn't make it, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, and that's kind of one of those, and, and and I feel like that's, you know, when you're able to, to when you're able to take those kind of roles on, where you have to really internalize being okay with not coming home, it it, it changes you as a person, you know, and it makes you more, it, it gives you that, it gives you that ability to take on those bigger risks, you know, and really dive deep into like what's important 
and what what things are worth, you know. And I I uh, you know, I now have kids and and I share with them a lot. I'm like it, it's the it's the risk versus reward, you know. Certain things are really worth laying it all the line on the line for, and other things just it's too much risk and it's not worth it. Like the payoff isn't enough, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I mean that was a that was a, a daily calculation in that job that really you know at worst meant one of your friends is like you know, right. and, uh, and so it was, it was a nice, it was a great way to start as a, you know, start my professional life. You know, it's just an interesting take on, you know, I don't, I didn't go to business school. I didn't, you know, it's like, I didn't go on to college. Um, I fought fire and I traveled and that's what I did. You know? mm -hmm. Most winters I'd go back and, and, uh, living in Alaska, it was really, why surfing didn't come into the picture sooner was because the winters were for snowboarding. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked all summer and I snowboarded all winter. And we had Alaska back in the day when the backcountry scene wasn't, you know, we, we, we snowboarded backcountry because we weren't allowed on the mountain yet. Like snowboarding right. had just been invented, you know, and so it was a really cool time to get to be part of that, you know. Um, but yeah. So. I think it's it's pretty cool you point to in that um, you know that moment where you're you know in that career um, realizing the the challenges that you're up against and the the consequences of a of a bad day right and yeah. then that giving you perspective on the remainder of your life right and making decisions that matter right living your life with purpose yeah so um, I, I, I having gotten to know you over the years it doesn't seem like there's very many decisions that get made without the bigger picture in view for you. So 100%. around this time, um, you know, I think we're, I don't know what year we're exactly at in your story, but where are we in terms of getting to Oregon, moving to the coast, getting into, um, yeah. So, yeah. So we, uh, yeah. So we finished our fire season. Which was in Oregon as well, right? Which was in Oregon, which yeah. was in La Grand, Oregon, the Union Hot Shots. <laughs> and uh, we finished our fire season. We went over, uh, the plan was to get married at the church that my wife's parents got married at. And her grandfather had been uh, the baby that they christened the church <laughs> when it was, it was, I, I, oh, I'm going to botch this story all up. She's going to be pissed at me. <laughs> anyway, so I, she's, so my wife comes from big Dutch, Irish Catholic family, um, just a salt of the earth people. Uh, the, the whole clan is just a handful of diamonds, right? These are your just cool down home kind of farmer people. Uh, her dad was an old Jippo logger back, back in the day when it was, um, you know, in the heyday of the logging in Oregon and stuff with all the crazy stories and, you know, it's like all the things Ken Kesey wrote about. It's, it, it's not bullshit. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so we came back, we got married. Um, that would have been in November. We had to, we were, our plan was to take the ferry to Alaska. We were going to, we were going to load the pickup up with everything we owned. We had a, we had a 93 Chevy regular cab pickup. Uh, and first ferry of the year was in March. Because um, they have to wait until they can go across the Gulf of Alaska, you know. And uh, even in March, where we went, it was, it was a wild trip. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we packed everything up. We wrapped up that winter. We were living in Legrand. Um and then March, we beat Cheeks for Alaska, took the ferry up, um, and we went up there with the intention of starting a fishing guide business. So, um, and that was, uh, I grew up, when I was growing up, uh, my folks split up when I was in right around fifth grade. My mom went on to marry a, um, a guy that was uh, really obsessed with fishing. And uh, he wasn't a guide at the time, but went on to, start his own they they went on to start a guide business and they did that um as i was older you know i was kind of in high school at that time so i was kind of around a little bit for it but then um 
you know, I figured it was like, great, this is a this is a great place to start. We can go back. It's an easy business to set up. It's a low entry. Let's just give it a whirl, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I got to introduce my wife to Alaska. I knew she'd love it. She was all in. And, and uh, we kind of just, you know, we, we've gone through our whole lives just kind of presenting these ideas and then, you know, throwing them around. And at first it's like, you know, of course we can't do that. That's crazy. And then it's like, wait a second, you know, like, right. what were you talking about? So, so we, we had that guy's business for five years and then 08 happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were, we just, we weren't established enough to make it, you know, I mean, it's one of those, those, a lot of those guides had been around for decades, you know, and, and we knew business was going to get tight. Um, and we just weren't up for weather in the storm. You know, it was like it was just going to be too rough. So that's we sold everything off, moved to Oregon. Um, and at this point in time, are either the boys uh, in the family yet? Yeah. So, yeah. So Tommy was born. So in our Alaska. oldest son, who's now 14, was born in Alaska. Um, and uh, when we moved down here, he was six months old. So um, we we got down to Oregon uh really with no idea what to do. It was the first time in my life I had ever made any kind of move with no plan professionally, you know? Um, and, and it was a, I, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it was a scary time. You know, mm-hmm. I remember when we, when we were trying to get set up, um, you know, we were just on the outskirts of Portland. Uh, I kept track up to the 300th resume that I sincerely uh, put in for a job. And then I, I finally got a little part-time job at REI in the bike shop, and um, which, uh, you know, I, growing up in Alaska, I had their, um, I could go down so many rabbit holes. But <laughs> there's a whole mountain bike side of the world sure. that doesn't, and, and you look, know, that we haven't short, touched on. Short story but. long, I mean, you've, you've ventured into a number of different businesses. Yeah. Ultimately, it yeah. leads you to real estate, which you did in Portland yeah. for a so, while. So, and that's kind of how, so I ended up getting into real estate. Because all I could get is little part-time jobs, and I just wasn't right. making it. And I, I was, uh, at the time, you know, we, we have, uh, when we first moved down there, we were getting established. We had our, our oldest son, Tommy, and uh, you know, my wife had picked up a great, like more consistent job. And so I was kind of Mr. Mom doing my thing on the side. And, and, uh, I basically, I got to do everything with my mm-hmm. son. I mean, I, I started a career with a front pack, you know, right. it was me and right. Tommy, me and Tommy and, and, uh, you know, and a sale and, agreement. And so. key aspects of getting into that were the freedom that real estate can afford, right? And in, in, in terms of being able to, I mean, I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. Like I got into real estate because <laughs> I had no other options, okay. you know. And it was one of those things. I looked at it and I'm like, I, I always had a, I always had an interest in it, you know. Sure. I mean, I like, like I know, no different than you do, right? And it's just I, I always found it interesting. And we had bought a house and sold it, so I had that as experience. Right. And, uh, and I just, I, I, my wife and I made an agreement. This kind of what we'll do is, is, you know, I said, I said, listen, let's give this a shot. Give me three years, you know? And if, if it's not working in three years for either of us, I'm out. I'll pull the plug. No harm, no foul. But just it, it, give me enough time to let this take. And, and, you know, I just looked at it as I'm like, it's going to be tough for a few years. I mean, I got into the real estate in 2010, mm-hmm. bottom of the market. You know, we were basically just rolling around in the gutter. You know, it hadn't started picking up at all. And I kind of looked at it. I, I really got into it because I looked around and the company I, I originally joined. I remember I met with uh, principal broker, David Sly, Prudential Real Estate. And this was an office that normally would have an average of 120 agents. Mm-hmm. And they were down to like 25. And I'm like, I can get a desk right next to the president. I'm like, mm-hmm. I know real estate's hard, but I only have to sell like three or four of these things a year to replace my income. So what, you know, I'm like, right. I, think I, I think I can pull that off. And, and that's kind of how it started. You know, it's not like I took off and it was this great, you know, right. we were making a bunch of money. I mean, I, I hustled, man. I hustled, I grinded. I, I you know, I, I do a lot of, I, I, do a lot of mentoring and coaching with with agents now and i'm like look 
I mean, don't do it. Don't 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 do what you're doing based on what you see me do now, because this is not the way I did business when I started. You know, it's like in learning that kind of profession, right? I mean, it's all day, every day. There was never a day that I didn't put 16 hours in. You right. know, I mean, vacation or no. Well, I think you had a deeper why at that point with the start of your family, and and, yeah. and ultimately there there came the day with the decision, right, where you were like. I have figured this out. Real estate can sustain and support my lifestyle choices. We want to go to the coast. You know, what, yeah. what ultimately yeah. was that breaking point where you were just like, I need to be on the water? Uh, it was, uh, it was enough, enough pain was introduced into my life at the time. So I had been in real estate for about five years. I had started a brokerage. Uh, you know, I pretty quickly was like, okay, I need to be in charge of my own fate. Right, because there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces in real estate. A lot of things change. There's just a lot of change all the time, right? And I said, "All right, well, I'm just gonna start my own thing and go that route." And and uh, I was about five years in. The business was going decent. Like I was pulling, you know, I was doing, I was doing pretty well. And there was just this hole forming inside of me, you know. And uh, it just got worse and worse and worse. And and I ended up. Um, that was when I found podcasts. That's when I found, you know, I'd never heard the word podcast. I had never heard the word, uh, like I had never heard of coaches or mentors or any of that stuff, right? And I'm like, I don't know what I got to do, but I got to find somebody to talk to or I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's not going to be good. And, uh, and it got really, um, there was a lot of... I, I started feeling a lot of pressure when, so this was about the same time when my youngest son, Bruce, was born. And so now we've got two kids. I'm in this town that I, I, I really like it, but it's just not, you know, I, it's just not me, right? It's not serving me. I'm not, I just don't feel like I fit in the right place. And, and I, I, I started to have, it was almost like there was a lag because before that I was really on just survival mode. Like, mm -hmm. I would, didn't care what I had to do. You know, right. it's like if the paycheck was there, I'm showing up. But that, now I'm hitting a point where it's like, okay, you know, now we're doing it. And, and this, real, I, this real nagging uh, emotion kept coming up that, that I eventually found out that it, it was kind of, it had to do with, you know, this career I had had prior. Um, some things, man, I, when you do those real high pressure, kind of heavy risk, like kind of jobs and then transition into this kind of business world, some guys can struggle with that. And, and I actually found a guy, uh, Simon Smart, um, that was that had started uh, like a coaching program, like a group coaching program for guys that his focus was really guys that had been in like um, high risk military type jobs and then transition into entrepreneurship. And what happened was a lot of these guys that he had worked with pre prior in actually training and coaching for uh, going into combat situations, they weren't coming back or they were coming back and they were killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And it became a problem that, that, that he decided to devote himself to, to trying to solve. Um, you know, and, and I'm not going to say that I was suicidal or anything like that, but you know, it, it's that I think when we hit those low points in our life, it's like, I just, it's tough to find people to talk to that it can resonate with. And, 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 you know, and it's hard to do anything about it, right? Like it's hard to have the energy. It's hard to, and, and I remember there was a real pivotal moment was, um, you know, I, I was interviewing with them, discussing working together and I, you know, I go through and blah, 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 tell my whole woe is me story. And he, you know, patiently listens. And at the end of it, he goes, well, how about your physical health? I'm like, well, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't have time for that. I'm telling you, I need to fix my business. You know, it's mm -hmm. da, 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 da. He goes, tell me more. Let's talk about your physical health. You know, and then that's where I started to. I just kind of, I just kind of, I, I went into that and I decided to just blindly trust somebody and say, you know what, what I'm doing isn't working, so I'm going to try this guy's way. And it, 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 long story short, basically led for me going from uh, a five, my first run was a 
five mile run in skate shoes because I had long since thrown away my running shoes uh, into me making the decision to run a hundred mile ultra marathon that year. Um, and that year, while my business was kind of suffering, not doing great, um, I basically devoted myself to training for a hundred mile ultra marathon and uh, signed up for a race in Zion. It was nine months away. Family was on board. Wife was ready to not live with the guy she was living with. So <laughs> she was perfectly happy to support me in that. And, uh, and that's what I did, man. I just started running. Um, you know, I went, I did that. Uh, I didn't finish. I ended up, it really became a, a bigger lesson in, in how to fail graciously and how to, how to learn how to use failures, right? Because sure. it's something that I think has to be learned, not really, it's not really an innate thing. And, and uh, but what happened was even more, uh, even more significant than the race, the training, anything was just a conversation my wife and I had on the way home. And we're driving home from Zion. We turned it into a whole family trip, you know, obviously Jessel style. Sure. And uh, we're driving home, and, and, and I came up with, with something came to me that really I've used over and over and over in my life. Um, and that was, was, uh, was we're talking, we're looking at it, and, and we knew up to this time, I mean, I was surfing a lot. And I kind of, what had happened was I was, uh, we we're splitting time between surfing and snowboarding up at Mount Hood. Well, we're on the west side of Portland. And so I've got Portland rush hour traffic that then leads into, you know, the mountain traffic. And I'd have to get up at like three in the morning to go up and surf Mount Hood. And I had nothing against Mount Hood. It's a great, great mm -hmm. place. But I mean, I came from snowboarding, you know, Thompson Pass in Alaska, right. and, you know, and all this stuff. So it wasn't, great and then but we're under a we're under an hour to the beach right and I, over time i just started going to the mountain less and the beach more to the point where we were out there every weekend and then right. finally it was like why are we coming back you know but but on our way home i really was putting some thought into it and i go you know honey i think we could make it at the coast you know i think i could take my real estate business over there I think we could do it. And, and as we talked, it's like, you know, when, when you look at it, I mean, worst case scenario, I'm sure you can get a job that's similar to the one you have. I know I can do real estate in Portland. So we're really living our worst case scenario. And we came home, we stuck a sign in the yard, we packed our shit and we left. And we went to the beach. And uh, to this day, I can tell you, I'll never live further than I can walk to the beach in flip-flops like it's a hard rule for us you know and uh, and I don't think that'll ever change you know you know this well but one of my favorite quotes of all time is if you don't do it this year you'll be one year older <laughs> than you do right and the the story there reminds me of a longer soliloquy that Warren Miller made in one of his films Storm where he he's talking about Steamboat Colorado and this actually captured me when I was 23, you know, and convinced me to quit my job and pack my stuff in a car. But he, he's basically, uh, the way it goes is, if all you dream about is f sun filled days and powder snow, quit your job in the city, pack everything into a trailer and drive to Steamboat. Besides, what job do you have in the city that you can't have right here? When the snow falls, we play. And that just resonated for me for years. Yeah. Another thing you said in there that resonates is when I first started surfing and getting to know you, you said, just wait, you're a surfer now. You'll see when you go back to go skiing and riding again, it's not going to be the same as it used to be once you get a good wave. And yeah. my life has forever been different, um, you know, since the, since the first wave. Yeah. Um, but I think it's that, right? You're, you, you, now you're in a different chapter of it where you're starting to get your kids into surfing, you're going to the coast every weekend, the yeah. family's having a really nice time. Again, you're thinking of your bigger picture. Um, one thing I'd like you to touch on is you have a, uh, a quote or a personal mission statement written on your poster board in your office 
and I wish I could remember it or recite it by <laughs> memory. Me too. <laughs> but I'm going to ask I, I, I you. I look at it every day, I'm, I'm going to ask you to give it your best attempt because I think it's pretty profound. Well, it, it really, you know, I, it was another, I, I, I'm your classic uneducated entrepreneur that's leaned on coaching and mentoring for my entire career. And, and uh, I, it was another... Another great dude I ended up finding, Christian Puma, and, and he was actually just uh, trying to tackle coaching, and and uh, he put this thing together where it was like the whole program was creating this board, and and I do, I, I keep this board uh, uh, up for everyone to see in my office, and it, it, it's pretty intimate, you know, I mean, it, it really, this is the, this is the, this is it, man, this is, this is what's in my gut that drives me, and uh but, but we spent three months together just in, it was just writing this one poster, you know, and, and I updated every year. Um, but what I, I, through everything that I've gone through as far as, is, uh, um, you know, with, with my different professions and, and, uh, different things I've done is, is, uh, you know, I really just wanted to get to the bottom of, like, what is the definition of my extraordinary life? You know, I, I really, uh, um, and, yeah, I, really what it came down to me is, and, and just being able to, I think it's important that we all really need to be able to design or uh, define what success is to us, you know, and I think that's something that, that really has, um, I just, I see too many people chasing other people's versions of success, you know, and, and we have this, a lot of us have this idea that, well, we all have this idea that life's supposed to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. What we don't really understand and see is that that is completely different for every single person, you know? It's like, it's all based on what you have seen over your life, right? That all looks normal. I mean, if you're, you know, if your family gets together for naked volleyball every Saturday at Blacks, then that's what is that's a normal upbringing, right? Uh, see, see, Cyrus Sutton for that one. <laughs> that's his story, <laughs> not mine. But, uh, but, uh, uh, so what I found for me was, you know, my definition of an extraordinary life basically comes down to it. It's it. Um, it, it all comes from a combination of my travels and my tribe. Um, it, it, uh, along the way, you know, and, and, and I, from my early beginnings in fire, leading in through entrepreneurship, everything else, I've, I've, I've just, I've learned how immensely valuable the people that you surround yourself with are. You know, and we only have so much time, um, and we do in our in our lives. I feel like we do waste a lot of time um, giving it to people that 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 it doesn't serve. It, you know, it's not serving both those people. That's why I call it my tribe. You know, it's like I take. Um, I take my loyalties with friends very serious. You know, I, I don't have an extraordinary amount of uh, close friends. And, and I kind of, um, but our family's created a, a family core values board. And on that board is snitches get stitches. And, and that's very easy to misconstrue, but it, it basically is, You know, one, once once I've told you that I'm committed to our friendship or our relationship, if 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 the unfortunate occasion arises, all you have to do is let me know, like, where do we need to bury the bodies? You know, and and I do, I I I, I take that very serious, you know, and and uh, and and I I guess you know, it's like I I, I mean it. I guess it doesn't really come as too much of a surprise, you know, when you, I mean, I spent the formative years of my early adult life with my job, like, it really was like, don't let your friends die, you know, mm -hmm. everything else will, will settle, let's just make sure, you're, you know, make sure nobody gets killed, 
Right. It's and so you know I, I'm sure that has a little bit to play with it, but I just you know I, I just kind of everything kind of boiled down to like I I need uh, I need the experience of travel to be able to see how other people live, you know, and expand my my perception of what what success means. And I can't do it without, I can't do it on my own. You know, I, I can't, right. I can't make all these pieces fit without, without the right people in my life. So, um, another thing I know about you and I'm going to put you on the spot, but I don't know if you'll have yeah. it exact. Uh, you talked about, you know, our time being precious and we all have so many, I think that's a fairly common epitaph, right? A lot of people, 493 months, there it is. He knows <laughs> the exact amount of months he has left in his life. So if all go- goes right, um, a guy of my uh, race and background and blah, 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 the average lifespan is 86 years if nothing else happens. Um, so if I lived 86 years old, that's four, I got 493 months left, you know, and, and, and I, that was something that, that uh, I certainly wasn't smart enough to come up with, but uh, another coach of mine, another mentor, uh, turned me onto that idea and I just loved it, you know, because it, it's the perfect number to look at days seem like too many years are too intangible but when you break it down to months like you know how fast a month goes and if you start looking at like i mean i I share that exercise with my dad and he got a little nervous you know he's getting getting up there you know uh and it's like yeah yeah that's it man that's all we got so you know do what you need to do but they seem to go faster and faster and i'm sure that that curve kind of levels off and slows down towards the end. But right when you're in the pocket, you know, and you're in the Dude, fun of your quick, life man. and the busyness of your life, right? We have careers, we have passions, especially if you're a surfer. I mean, think about the amount of time that you commit to the art of this sport on top of being a family man and having personal passions that go beyond right. the water. Right. Uh, y- you start to fill your day pretty quickly and, and the days just kind of open your eyes and close your eyes and it's over. Um, but they're, they're, life's more fun that way. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's like, let's not bullshit ourselves here. It's like, we're all standing on a rock hurtling through space at whatever it is, tens of thousands of miles an hour or whether, you know, I'm probably under exaggerating (laughs) that one, but I mean, you know, taking your little life too seriously is just ridiculous. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't, at the end of the day, it's like, what really matters, you know? It's like it, it, we we have to fill our lives with this idea that what we're doing matters, and it's like not really, you know. Yeah. I I mean I don't think that's the point. Like I don't think, you know, it's really. I I, I mean I gotta tell you I, I I I love putting people on the spot with the question of what do you. Those four words are almost impossible for, for just about anybody you ask because they'll want to, they'll come in, well, what do you mean? Like right now or like in general or like a year from now, I'm like, I don't give a shit. What do you want? You know, what, what's important? What, what are you working on? You know, what are you working towards? And it's amazing how hard that question is to answer. You know, I find myself questioning that uh, on a regular basis, you know, and, and I think you know, knowing what it is that you want to get out of life um, and learning enough to know that that's something that has to be rooted in, in service for it to mean anything um, is, is really, really all that matters, you know? I mean, because once, once, you, once you've figured that out, the rest of the pieces fall in place, you know? Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it just blows me away that it's not, that isn't as, that it, that isn't more of a part of our society, you know? I, I mean, it was a casual thing that the counselor asked you in high school, you know, oh, what do you want to do? You know, it's like, it, it should be taken a little more seriously than mm-hmm. that, you know? And, and that's kind of, uh, you know, I guess, you know, having a background, even even just growing up in Alaska, it's like, dude, people died up there. You know, there was an idiot tax, man. I had, I knew lot, I mean, I knew multiple people that died tragic, horrific, you know, 
accidents because of just the lack of support, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're, you know, when you get in those kind of wild west environments, you know, it's like, it's like, dude, people are going to go up in the mountains and not come home. Like, that's just the thing, you know? And, and, uh, and so I guess I just, with the background I've had, I just, you know, learned to value that. Cause there's, you know, it's nothing scares me more than wasting a day in my life. You know? Yeah. Your, your proximity to these extreme situations and life threatening instances, uh, gives you perspective. Yeah. Right, it gives yeah, you way more helps, perspective you know? on making every decision, every hour count. Um, not to say that we don't all waste a day, um, but uh, it's it's good to continue to think about. And I think your vehicle of looking at how many months you have to the average lifespan is a healthy way of thinking about your life and putting that in perspective. And you know, just a simple glance at the number of months you have left can be that subtle reminder to. You know, tell your yeah, kids you love cool them. And, tool, you know, you know, things like that. Yeah, <laughs> and I do. I post, I do think I it's post not over. it all over. You know, yeah. I've got it on my whiteboard. And it's I've got it's not overwhelming though. I think if you look at the the days, you'd be like, that's a big number. Yeah, uh, yeah it's you know. But if you look at the years, that. you're like, oh god, that's getting worse every year. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's interesting. So what one thing I want to touch on before before we wrap is, and, and and maybe we didn't get it into enough. We'll have to have you back to do this again. Yeah. Um, wow. But <laughs> we only made it halfway through there, man. <laughs> what I what I'd like to touch on is, you know, we obviously even hit the surfing part. Yet. I think you're right. It is a surfing podcast. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of your journey ha- re- can most aptly be stated as y- y- your proximity to these challenges and near death situations that you faced have opened your life to go for it in, in almost every yeah. aspect. And I yeah. know you personally that way as somebody that when your mind gets set on an idea or a passion, there's no getting in your way. It's going to happen, whether it succeeds or fails, mm-hmm. but we're going to try. Right. And, and that's, the, that's the glory of life, right? That it's all in the pursuit. It's all in going for it. So, yeah. you know, as we look to the future and we'll have to, like I said, we'll have to come back and talk a bit more about, you know, the, the surfing in Oregon, the owning of the surf shop, how we know one another by, by you being, quite literally the first person that owned a surf shop that gave me the time of day. I was annoying. Um, but coming from that and then starting to take strike missions with the whole family and the van down to Baja, you know, exploring all that, you know, where do you see your past impacting your future? You know, where are you headed next? Yeah. And, and I think I can, I can kind of, I can kind of sum up, um, you know, I can kind of, sum up the last decade of my life pretty fairly quickly. I mean, you know, we moved to the coast. Uh, my youngest son was two, oldest son was seven. Um, and we just, you know, I, we started just seeing the value in surfing as part of our family lifestyle, you know, and it really isn't a, it wasn't as much about the, the activity of surfing is just embracing you know, embracing putting more attention on the other side of the coastline. You know, the, the Earth's over 70% ocean. You know, we live on the, the minority part of the world, you know. And, uh, and I think you get, you know, and I think, you know, anybody living on the coast can probably relate. Like, you catch yourself being more interested in what's on the other side of the beach, you know. And, uh, and, and that's, I think, for all of us, surfing's kind of just the first part of our journey. And, and I mean, my life went, you know, I, I, I am, I'm an extremely obsessive person. So I ended up owning a surf shop. It was fantastic. I had little kids. I got to grow up, you know, running a surf shop. That was amazing. Uh, you know, we went on to create a surf camp in Oregon and we have, uh, that we still today are, are playing or working on in this, uh, Rancho Norte surf camp. And, uh, and uh, for for us, what we found was be, because we're both, uh, you know, me and my wife are both hoods from the woods. You know, it's like we don't we stick out in in public. You know, I mean we we, we do good on the outskirts, and and that's kind of what led us into Baja and finding that. And, and and you know, after our first introduction to Baja, that was it. That was it was. Uh, 
all our sites are just on spending more time down there. I, I feel like you could spend a lifetime on that peninsula and not scratch the surface. Mm. Um, there is an empty wave to ride every day of your life for the rest of your life if you want. Um, and so a lot of our, a lot of our activities and, uh, focus the last couple of years have been on that, uh, multiple trips down there, uh, met, it met and got to know just some phenomenal people, um, became very tied in with, uh, they're in Cerritos with, uh, with West Side Surf Camp. Um, and then as well, we have a, a friend, Pablo, who just had his second, uh, second son, Kai, here this last week, but he's with Baja Cabo Advisor. So we are, uh, we have, we're, we're doing a lot of work to see where in their businesses that we can, um, you know, help them and be able to be more involved. And there's just, there's multiple different projects down there that we're, we're kind of playing around with and that, but, um going to be exciting to see where it goes yeah i think that's kind of where you know that's kind of where we're we're heading i mean oregon's been phenomenal and and it'll always kind of be the the root of where our family was created um but man it's time to go get warm <laughs> waves <laughs> ready for some warm water surfing go, go live the desert rat lifestyle you know i i think in closing the correlation that i'd like to draw a, a straight line through of all the things discussed and tip of the iceberg is you talk about surfing as this like entryway to the 70% of the earth, right? And a whole other world that you couldn't hope to explore all of. If you dedicated every day of your life to, to that, you yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't nearly see, but a percent of it. And, um, that's how, you know, watermen and women are made right? It's, it, you, you, you take that ride, that ride has an impact on you. It changes you fundamentally mm -hmm. as a person and you start to explore a little bit beneath the surface. You, yeah. you get into spear fishing like you have, you know, yeah. you start getting into other aspects of oceanography and exploration that you're just like, it, it's like, it's like entering a new planet. Yeah. And, um, then you buy a sailboat, then you, <laughs> then you buy a bunch of other things you don't need, but are fun. And, and, you know, and the journey continues, but yeah. it's, it's that yeah. it's, it's the, if there's a thing that I feel it's that a, a lot of us that have never surfed or, or people that have never surfed that are living in cities and they've got great jobs and careers and families and it's all wonderful. It, the, the, the options of where you can go with your life are somewhat limited and, and, and you kind of find yourself on a path that doesn't have too much deviation unless you make an extreme change. But when you get into surfing and you get into that lifestyle of becoming a waterman or woman, you, you have the opportunity to explore limitless possibilities. Yeah. And, and it gives you the perspective that life can be enchanting at all times. I mean, surfing ruins you, man. You it know, does. You know, I mean, I, it, in the best you can way. compare it to anything, right? At surfing, surfing, skiing is, you know, the snow has to fall on the ground before you ride it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're not riding the snow as it's falling through the air, but we're, we're very literally chasing energy moving through the ocean that started, you know, preferably about 2,500 miles away. You know, we want a really good one. So <laughs> it's just a wild concept, right? That I think yeah. it, it's, uh, it definitely ruins you for life because you're not, uh, yeah. It, if it gets you, it gets you. Um, and, it, and it does change your life, I think, for the better. Um, Joe, amazing to have you on. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, so thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, beyond that, what's a great way for anybody that wants to reach out? Rancho Norte is something we didn't get enough time to talk about, but yeah, your, your yeah, whole yeah. surf ranch in Oregon. And if you're traveling through, a, a big goal of the podcast is to have community development, right? And if you're looking to get tied into surf culture and uh, the middle of the coast of Oregon, Joe may be the best guy that you could possibly meet. So, you know, reach out to him. What, what you know, you have yeah, Rancho Norte I mean, on and Instagram. Really that, you know, it, it, if for any reason anything spoke to you here, you know, I, I, I'd say, um, you know, especially if you're in a position that you're stuck, you're struggling, you don't know what to do, you know, and, and if there was anything that I said that resonates that, um, you know, please, 
feel free to reach out to me anytime. I mean, I think that's the best thing about the world we live in is it's accessible. I mean, Google my name and it'll pop up. You know, I, it's, it's, uh, I'm active on Instagram. Um, you know, I post on Facebook. It's easy enough to find uh, either my personal page on there or the, the Rancho Norte page. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a great way to, great way to reach out. And I, I, I want to thank you again for the, for the experience. And I, what you guys are doing down here in San Diego is fantastic. You know, I really, uh, you know, we talk about that tribe element and that's, you know, that is, is obviously a big passion of yours and, and a, a real driving force. Right. And, and I'm just, really grateful to get to be a small part of that you know um there's just those people that you meet that you know are they're out doing the real thing you know and it's like i don't i don't want to have a bunch of friends that are exactly like me and and uh but at the bottom of it you know we got to have that that same common denominator of 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 trying to build these relationships and and investing in them, right? I mean, that's that's uh, it's not it. It takes some work, you know. Every once in a while, your cousin Jeff calls you out on your bullshit in the morning, and you start fight <laughs> and you're falling in the yards. You know how it goes. <laughs> Joe, it's it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Thank you for driving the thousands of miles yeah, you have, not yeah. just for this episode, Anytime. but for, but I mean, for I, everything <laughs> along the way. We um, don't have to mention there. There might have been a, a small ice storm going on in Oregon <laughs> that you need to do. Didn't escape. have to twist my arm very hard. Well, we appreciate it. You're the man. Thank you for coming. And uh, we'll look forward to having you again. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Steve.